Perfect. Well, great. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Julian, as Walter mentioned, and I'm really happy to have you guys here to tell you a little bit about Jump. And uh, just to give you a sense of today, uh, I'm intending this webinar to be uh, really a first introduction to Jump. So if you've never seen it before, perfect. You're a great audience. I want to step you through what Jump is, how Jump thinks, and uh, really get you going on the software so you're on your way to understanding your own data. And so uh, let me give you a sense of today's schedule. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of Jump, just rather briefly. I'll talk about something I call the anatomy of Jump. So this is really the, the workings of the software, the architecture. Uh, we'll talk about some summarizing and graphing of data. I mean, a lot of what we use statistics for is really summarizing and displaying data. So I want to give you some uh, kind of an idea of how Jump works with uh, displaying and really conveying the results of your data. And we'll talk about analysis in three platforms. And I'll just foreshadow there are three major platforms in Jump I want to show you. Distribution, Fit Y by X, and Fit Model. And you'll find yourself using these three platforms quite a bit as they hold uh, a great number of different analyses. And finally, I'll cover some resources with you today. There's lots of great learning resources. So, you know, after this webinar is over, you're not just on your own. There's lots you can do to uh, learn more. And then, of course, we'll leave time for question and answers. All right, so why don't we go right to it? Let me uh, tell you a little bit about the history of Jump, just because I think it gives some nice context to why Jump is the way it is. So Jump was started in 1989 by John Saul. So he's one of the co-founders of SAS. And in fact, this makes uh, this year our 25th anniversary year. And we were actually just at a big conference in North Carolina back at the SAS home, ca uh, home base. And uh, I snapped a picture of Jump 1 running on a, uh, a Mac SE. So I don't know if any of you remember your Mac SEs, but uh, that's Jump 1 running on it. And so it still looks beautiful today. And so John, when he came up with this, and it was actually just a program he developed for the Macintosh, John's Macintosh project or program, as it as was called then, uh, was really came about because the Macintosh computer offered a great new way to interface with computing in general. I mean, it had a mouse, it was very visual. And up to that point, statistics software was really routine based. It was a really a terminal or a command line. You entered in an analysis, some server process the result, and in an output log, you receive the result. Now, that's not how Jump was structured. Jump was meant to be more of an interface to your data, a connection to your data that was ongoing, it was dynamic, and it was unfolding. So Jump has always been built on this idea of graphics forward. A lot of graphics will show in Jump by default. And to really let you dig through your data in a process of discovery. So Jump is not one of these pieces of software where you run an analysis and you're done. Instead, in Jump, you select the type of interface to your data you wish, and you could unfold the analysis and dig deeper at any point. Let's just give you a brief sense of this. Let me pull up some sample data, and I'll show you how I got to these sample data in a second. And so if you've never seen Jump, let me just give you a real quick idea of what I mean by being graphics forward, being interactive, and really being uh, enabling of the process of discovery. So I'm just going to produce some quick output here just to show you a little bit of what Jump does. So I'll produce some, here's some ellipses. So these are measurements for different flowers, actually, so different species of irises. And so we're looking at measurements on sepal length there. I'll show you a contour plot really quickly. It's kind of interesting. We have the three species in our data set, and they're colored here. And so the points here are all individual flowers and their measurements. So we can see that some of these species overlap a lot, at least in two dimensions. And kind of an interesting, fun thing from this data set is if we look at these data in three dimensions, so here's a 3D scatter plot. Let me just rotate it around. You can see that there's actually considerable separation between these species once we get to three dimensions of representing the data. And actually, R.A. Fisher, a really famous statistician of the 20th century, uh, used these data to first talk about something called discriminant analysis, the ability on the basis of observable variables to categorize or distinguish uh, individuals or different units of analysis. So Jump is very graphical. As you can see, I'm clicking through. Uh, I'm not stuck in a platform once I create output. I can just keep moving forward. So let me show you another example. Let me pull up some quick movie data that will play with a little bit more. Now, a lot of times when we get data sets, we just simply need to uh, graph it. We just want to answer some questions visually. And so I'll quickly show you a platform. And of course, we'll go over all of these a bit more in a second. Uh, but I'll just take a couple of these categories. So type of movie, the rating of the movie, and the worldwide, uh, let's say, dollars. I'll just put them in the middle, turn on a box plot. And so what's great about Jump is very quickly, you can develop an insight into what the meaning is behind all your numbers. Of course, looking at a data set with, in this case, 277 rows, that's not very illuminating. But once we put it in a representation, a visual representation, we gain a lot of information from, from the data. So that's always been Jump's approach, 
visualize and understand. I mean, the best processor of data, of patterns, is really your human mind. I mean, we are, have an incredible capacity to understand things visually and see patterns. So what Jump, I think, does amazingly well is connects us to our data in a capacity or in a mode that works very well for the human mind. And so I have always loved Jump for that. You get a lot of meaning from data with almost no work at all. All right, so let's take a step back and let's see how Jump actually is working. And I like to spend time on this section because especially when you're starting out, it's incredibly important to understand what the software is doing and thinking and what it expects from you when you're actually defining analyses or setting up your data. So I'm going to pull up a sample data set, another one. This one's called Restaurant Tips. And uh, so you know, if you want any of these sample data sets, they're included in Jump under the Help menu. So let me point you there first. So under Help, there's a section here called Sample Data. And if you open this, you get a sample data index that'll give you the sample data files listed by analysis and also by the sort of field or the type of data they're good for. Uh, you'll also find under teaching resources, for any of you teaching, some really great resources here, some simulations, so simulating the central limit theorem, uh, very basic calculators for working from summary statistics, and some really nice teaching demonstrations. So these are all scripts that are written in the jump scripting language that actually let you uh, demonstrate concepts. So in this case, it's a demonstration of least squares. And actually, I can turn on my squares. You know, I can actually see what line minimizes the sum of the squared residuals. So these are all built-in teaching demonstrations. But for our purposes, we're going to be using sample data. So if you're going to follow along, I would suggest clicking open the sample data directory. And then you can navigate to whichever file I was using. So in this new, newest case, I'll be using restaurant tips. So you can just go directly there. All right. So let's take a look at this data set because we haven't really uh, broken apart what we're looking at yet. And of course, if you've ever worked with an, in a spreadsheet program, this probably looks pretty familiar. We have rows and we have columns. Now, the jump data table is a little bit special. Uh, it enforces certain rules that you won't find in, let's say, Microsoft Excel. The first thing is that there's a dedicated column row, right? So the column headers don't exist in row one like you might have in an Excel spreadsheet. Instead, they have their own section at the top. And this is important because the data that's in our particular cells for a particular column needs to be the same. So let me unpack that. Look at what we have here, something like bill amount and tip amount and credit cards. Right? These three variables are storing, of course, different data. So we have two that are storing dollars, and all the values in these columns are just dollars. And then we have another column that's storing what's really something categorical, something that's just a, a category in the environment somebody using a credit card or not at a restaurant. So notice that at the bottom of our, our table here, we don't have things like equals average. We don't put call, uh, cell formulas in jump tables. Instead, the data that's in each column needs to be of a single type. And I'm going to unfold why that's important when we talk about the mind of jump. So for now, just note that data in each column is all of a single type. Now, second, I want you to notice how the data set itself is organized. We have the data view over here. So all the actual observations we have and the columns we've seen. We also have a list of our columns on the left. And this is really nice when you have very large data sets. So if you have very wide data with thousands of columns, it actually is sort of nice to have a list of them over here. And Jump also gives you the ability to uh, organize your columns. So if I select a bunch of them here, I can right click and I can group these columns. So I only mention this because it's very useful when you have very large data. So let me ungroup those. So notice that we have a columns list over here that represent our columns in the actual data table. We have a rows section, which says how many rows we have selected. So I can select eight of them here, and it'll tell me. And the rows, the rows section also gives me some additional options. I'm going to talk about these red triangles in just a minute. But notice that our data set, very standard, kind of organized the same way you might see in most programs. Now, most data uh, programs or most uh, analysis software will give you options for each variable. And so I just want to point you in this direction. If you right click, there's the option for column info. And I want to just point this out because you should get familiar with this platform or this, uh, this settings table. Once you're in column info, you can set up a lot of very important features of these data. So the formatting here, right, I set this as currency. But there's two incredibly important sections, data type and modeling type. And so I'm going to hold off on talking about those for a second. And I'm going to expand this mind of jump section because I want to kind of step back and sort of tell you about the general organizing principle of jump. And I would say it's about a process, not a procedure. And so by this, I mean, if you think about all the analyses and all the things we can do in statistics, 
There's lots and lots of analyses, thousands and thousands of them. Jump can do thousands of different things. If you had to organize them yourself, you're the architect of a user interface. If you had to organize a thousand plus analyses and procedures and do it in menus, how would you do it? Now, in a lot of software, uh, and this isn't a bad thing really, but in a lot of software, you'll find extensive menus with lots and lots of hierarchies. So you'll go to an analyze menu in a piece of software and there'll be maybe 40 options here, each with you know dozens underneath them. Now, by comparison, if you look at jump menus, especially the analyze menu, it's not particularly expansive. That is, there's some sections for modeling, multivariate, which definitely do have hierarchies, but for the most part, we have a pretty simple list. Now, the reason why is Jump is organizing things by domain or by process. And so to give you a sense of what that means, something like distribution, this platform, is going to support all sorts of different types of analyses as long as they deal with univariate questions, questions that are about a single variable at a time. Something like FitY by X is going to be a bivariate platform. So all the analyses that relate to kind of comparisons among variables, so two at a time. And so I'll give you a sense of how this works, but the way Jump is going to organize these analyses takes into account something that most other software doesn't, which is called the modeling type of a variable. And so modeling type in Jump, and I'll actually click out of here and go back to the table, because you may have seen these. Modeling type in Jump is uh, illustrated here by an icon, and this is something we are allowed to set. And so we have modeling types that are continuous, so these are actual quantitative measurements, so something like bill amount and tip amount, right? numeric measurements that actually mean something. And then we have categorical variables, nominal or ordinal. And so I don't want to refresh you from your intro stats, but nominal variables are just categories in the world, like whether a credit card was used or not, whereas ordinal variables are ordered categories. So something like small, medium, and large for t-shirt sizes. Right? We know small is smaller than medium and medium is smaller than large, but they're not necessarily as far from each other. Large and medium might be really close together in size, whereas small could be really far from medium. Right? That's an ordinal variable. So Jump is going to pay attention to these variables. It wants you to explicitly define what your variables mean. And it's a really good thing that it does this because Jump will, won't have to prompt you multiple times when it produces analyses. Instead, it can know on the basis of these modeling types what you're trying to do. So Jump is going to be a little bit more intelligent about producing output. And so let me show you that while also talking about one final thing about Jump, something about the mind of Jump. And that is that Jump is progressive. And I've alluded to this before. Jump unfolds as we're producing analyses. And it does this in a context-dependent way, in a way that pays attention to modeling type. And so let me give you a sense of all these at once. I'm going to go to Analyze. Let me go to this platform I've already mentioned, Distribution. Now, distribution, like I said, is a univariate platform. It's a platform that answers questions that deal with individual variables. And let me just give several of these variables into Y columns. And so this is known as casting columns into a role. What I'm telling Jump is, these are the columns I want to actually work with. I'm going to hit OK. And what Jump is going to do is launch this platform output window. Now, remember I said that Jump isn't like a lot of other software where it's a procedurally based sort of output log generating a program. Instead, Jump is creating interfaces to your data. And what we're looking at here is a univariate interface to our data using the variables I selected. And this is what I mean by interface. Let me click on some stuff. Let me click on yes. So now we're looking at all the people or all the rows in the table where yes was what they use for credit card. And so these are people who use credit cards at their tables and I could see their overall bill amount, tip amount, right? I can see the marginal distributions. So these interfaces that Jump creates, they're not static. Everything is selectable. I could even select within a distribution to see you know, which tables that had the highest tip, what they look like in terms of number of guests or day of week, right? They're all dynamic. And Jump is also doing something special here. It's not showing us every possible analysis that you could do in distribution. Instead, it's starting us off and it's going to allow us to dig deeper. And so that's what I mean by this progressive interface. Now, the seat of the progressive interface, the method, are these red triangles. And if you look around the screen, you'll actually see a lot of red triangles. There's one for each of our variables, and then there's one at the very top here, next to distribution. Let me first click that one. This is a red triangle or a menu that will define the entire platform because it's next to the platform name. So if I click that, you'll see I have some options. I can uniformly scale 
everything in this window. I can stack. Let me show you what stack does because this is actually something many of you might like. So if we stack the variables, then we actually get them on their side. That's kind of a way that you would normally see them. Okay, so that's the topmost red triangle. Let's look under the red triangle for each variable. Now these give me options to move further. Red triangles always let you go further. And if we're in a univariate platform like distribution, and we're clicking on a red triangle next to a quantitative, a continuously modeled variable, notice that all the options make sense for that, like testing a mean. I could do a one sample t-test right here if I'm, if I'm simply testing a mean on a continuous variable. I could produce a normal quantile plot, Right? I can gain more output, maybe fit a distribution. I can gain more output without ever leaving the platform. It's progressive. I've been able to dig deeper while I'm in this particular output. Let me click this gray triangle. Gray triangles minimize output. I'm going to click the one, one next to tip amount too. Now credit card, remember credit card is a different modeling type. We set it up the same way. We went into the exact same platform. But look at this red triangle. This red triangle, because it's paying attention to modeling type, is showing us options that make sense when we have categorical distinctions in the world. So things like testing proportions. This would be a chi-square uh, goodness of fit test. We could actually designate a null and alternative hypothesis, or in this case, just the null hypothesized probabilities, right? And this would produce that output. So notice that jump is progressive. It's uh, letting you dig deeper while you're already in a platform. And it's also doing this in a very special way. It's paying attention to what your variables mean in order to produce output that makes sense. All right, so those are the pieces I like to call the mind of jump here. Now, I'll make one final point before I leave this section, which is the progressive interface is great in the sense that you can move quickly between related analyses, but it has one drawback, which is let's say you're looking for a particular analysis and you don't want to go digging through menus. Because notice in jump, it could be you know nested below certain platforms. Now, once you get to know jump really well, and I've, I've known jump for a long time, so I feel like it's an old friend, I can guess where a lot of analyses will live. But when you're just starting out, I would like to direct you under the help menu to something called the statistics index. And the statistics index is a named or ordered list of all the different analyses you can do in jump. So if you're going to one in particular, I'll just type Mahalanobis. It's a favorite outlier detection procedure of mine. You can click the topic help. It'll show you a description of what this analysis actually is. And you can just click launch and Jump will bring up the platform in which the analysis actually lives. So in this case, it brings up the multivariate platform. And here's the Mahalanobis distance plot. So the statistics index is a very useful thing as you're just starting out. It'll help you find those analyses you're looking for without having to dig through any menus. All right, so that leaves us, or finishes us with the mind of Jump. Now make some important notes about data. Uh, file size, you don't have a technical limitation with Jump. You could open any size file as long as you have enough RAM. So I think the rule is typically half as much RAM uh, as you have should be your maximum file size. To create a jump table, of course, because sometimes you want to enter in your own data, that's just file, new data table. And if you want to open data, you can just do file open. There's nothing very special you have to do. And I'll make a note that jump works with lots of different file types. Of course, jump and SAS files, Excel can read, SPSS, text CSV files, R files. So jump is very flexible. You can read in lots of different uh, file types. Now, finally, I'll mention a couple important features just to make sure you know about them. Uh, column and row states. So in our data table, we can exclude rows. Just select one, right click, and you can click hide and exclude. I may uh, have time to come back to distinguish for you what hide and exclude really mean. Hide is really just whether it shows in an output, and exclude is whether it gets included in the actual calculations. The same things are true for columns. You can right click a column, and you can hide or unhide a column, or exclude or unexclude a column. Under the rows menu, I haven't talked about rows, but I always like to point people towards this. There's something called the global data filter, where if we're doing analyses and we wish to only consider a small part of our data set, the data filter lets you actually exclude particular output or particular rows. So I can say, let me filter on the basis of credit card, and I want to only include no's. So notice that when I clicked the no and said only include those, everything else was excluded. And so the data filter is a great way to produce specific analyses when you only want to consider a subset of your data set. I want to talk about one particular role. It's called a by variable. And I always like to make sure people know about this. Let me go back to that distribution platform we just looked at. And let me put something like tip amount in here. So it's under the Y columns, just one variable. Let's say we wanted to look at tips separated by servers. 
So I could put server as a by variable. And I want you to see what jump's going to do. When I click OK, jump will split up that distribution output, one for server A, one for server B, and one for server C. And so this gives us the ability to break apart analyses as we want on the basis of levels of other variables. All right, and I'll show you broadcasting commands in just a minute. What I want to do is uh, jump out of the anatomy section and start showing you some neat things you can do with Jump to really understand your data quickly. And I want to talk about, uh, I'll talk about the first two and then we'll come back to bubble plots. But I want to talk about two great ways of understanding or really summarizing and synthesizing data. Uh, the first is tabulate, which is much like a pivot table in Excel. And so what tabulate lets you do is on the basis of really dragging and dropping uh, your rows and columns, you can create nice tables that actually try to convey whatever you're, you're intending to convey. So let's look at this. I'll actually stay with this data set for a second. I'm going to go to the Analyze menu, which is where Tabulate lives. If you're using Jump 10 or earlier, Tabulate used to be under the Tables menu, so be aware of that. So let me go to Analyze, and let me select Tabulate. And so let me orient you to what we're looking at. Tabulate has a listing of your columns on the left. It has a listing of the statistics that you can calculate in the middle. And then we have this little palette, which is full of drop zones. So there's drop zones for rows, columns, and the resulting cells. So let me give you a sense of how this works. You know, using the data we have, we're looking at restaurant tips. Probably the most important or interesting thing, to me at least, to understand is tip percentage. How does that vary as a function of these other variables? So let me drag tip percentage in the center. And notice that when I hover my mouse over a drop zone, it highlights. So be aware of that. You'll see us using a couple different drop zones today. So I'm going to drop tip percentage right in the center. And the default summary statistic for jump is the sum really the easiest one it can do. So this is the sum of all the tip percentages in our data set, which is kind of a meaningless thing. So let's change sum. Let's make that something different. I'm going to take mean from the statistics table, and I'm going to drop it on top of sum. And I want you to see something. As I hold it over the sum label, the whole cell is highlighted. Now, in Jump's mind, what it thinks you're asking it to do is replace sum in the table. So if I drop it here, it simply replaces it. Let me click undo and let me show you something else. Let me hold mean again. Remember, here's the drop zone to replace. There's two drop zones, one on the right and one on the left, which are special. These are appending drop zones. So I can prepend the mean to this table. So add it to the start, or I could put it at the end. So append it there. So just be aware that those two drop zones differ from the center drop zone. Dropping it right on top of some replaces. And then the other ones add to it. And that's actually something you'll see in a lot of Jump uh, interactive platforms. All right, so here's the average across all the observations. 16.61 is the mean percentage. But that's not too super interesting. We have lots of other variables that give us ways to slice this up. So for instance, whether somebody used a credit card or not, if I want to know whether that tip percentage is different or just summarize that, I want you to see this drop zone right here for rows. If I drop it right here, Jump will immediately split up that tip percentage by credit card. Now, remember what I said about the left and right sides of the drop zone? So if I drop day of week right on top of credit card, it'll replace it. But if I drop day of week to the left or to the right, I can actually make this nested. So let me drop it to the right. So here we have tip percentage by credit card split apart by day of week. At the top, we can also break apart analyses. Let me take server and let me drop this in a drop zone up here. So if you look right here, there's a little drop zone, drop zone for columns. And if I drop that variable on top, I actually split it up by server as well. Notice there are missing cells. Some servers didn't work certain days of the week or did work certain days of the week, but didn't have a credit card or not sale. So those missing cells will be there if you don't have the data to actually calculate a mean. But notice the tabulate lets us create these tables quite effortlessly. And we can create really complex tables without having to uh, set up very much in a dialog box. You can always click Done when you're done. And remember, these red triangles always take you further. So whenever you see a red triangle, especially when you're starting to learn Jump, click it. Certainly click every one you see, and you'll get to know the software much quicker. Uh, this one, you'll notice we have some other options. We can show a little chart here, tool tips. Uh, the one that I like is Make into Data Table. So once you actually create a tabulation, sometimes you want to work on those data in a more uh, formal way afterwards. So you can actually tabulate these data and work with them further. All right, so that's tabulate. Now I want to show you something like tabulate, but the graphical equivalent, 
which is called Graph Builder. So Graph Builder is under the Graph menu. And Graph Builder, like Tabulate, is built around drop zones. And these drop zones allow you to create the visuals that you're interested in creating. And the way I always explain this to people is, first imagine what type of graphic you want, and then simply put the columns in the places that would create that graphic. I know that sounds simple, but I've, I often have people say, you know, what type of graph should I make? And it's, it's whatever conveys the story you need to convey. So if we're most interested in tip percentage, let's actually work with that. I'll drop that on the Y. Notice that's a drop zone. I could also drop it on the X, it's a different drop zone. Let me drop it on the Y. And before I go on, I just want you to see all that Jump is doing here is plotting the Y location for each point in the data set. So each point here, this is row three. And then the X axis I haven't defined. So Jump is simply showing us the response for Y. But even with one variable, notice that on this ribbon, we have some different options. I can turn on a box plot. I could turn on the contour plot I showed you before. I could even add by clicking and dragging the points back in. I could add points on top of the contour. All right, so these are all options that work when we only have one variable specified. Let's try another variable though. That's not very interesting to me. Let's break it up by credit card again. I'm going to drag credit card to a couple different drop zones. So here's the drop zone for X. Here's the grouping for Y. So you notice we can group there. And here's grouping for X. So we can split them up on left or right. I'm going to just put it on the X axis here. So we have a cluster for no, <coughs> excuse me, a cluster for no's and a cluster for yeses. Now I like box plots a lot. I think that conveys a lot about the data, the spread, and uh, also shows you some potential outliers here. So I'm going to keep box plots on, and let's actually take another variable. Let's use day of week again, and let's see how we can further split up this analysis or this output on the basis of another variable. So let's try group for X. Notice what that'll do. Within credit cards here, we have Monday through Friday. We can use this section called wrapping, which wraps around the table. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday on left and right. Group for Y does what you would expect it. Same thing as group for X, but splits it apart on the vertical. And then I want to show you one other section, which is overlay. And the overlay colors these bars and puts them all next to each other with a legend. Right, so a different way of dicing up these data. Now remember, whatever your message is, whatever you're trying to convey is going to uh, really constrain the type of graphic you want. If I'm most interested in comparing no's versus yeses of credit card, but I want to contextualize that within day of week, I would probably do something like this, where I have days of week splitting up the analysis and then credit cards right next to each other. All right, so that's Graph Builder with some simple data. Let me show you a couple additional things you can do with Graph Builder because it's, it's pretty amazing. Here's another data, te uh, data set, it's called SAT by year. And uh, it has data for 52 states, or 52 states, or 50 states plus District of Columbia. Um, and we have it across, uh, what is this, eight years here. So we have eight rows for each state. And so what we're looking at principally with this data set is achievement for education. So we have SAT scores, we have ACT. But maybe we just want to visualize something across the country overall. And so let me go to Graph Builder. Let me show you something that's really neat and a, a drop zone I didn't use, which is called Map Shape. And I'm going to take state here, and I'm going to drop it into map shape. And notice that jump will immediately create this display of the United States. Now my rows, you might have noticed in the table, my rows have already been colored. And coloring for rows, you can do under the rows menu. It's called color or mark by column. But in Graph Builder, we have this color option here. And so I can just drag another variable. Let's say SAT math scores. I'm going to actually just drag that right into the center. And notice that jump is smart enough to know you want to color by that variable. And so here we have the map looking across really all the years, the SAT math scores geographically. And just to drive home that jump lets you cut apart your data a lot, a lot uh, let's use this wrap variable. I'm going to drag year across and drop it right into wrap. And so you can see we can actually look at changes over time even uh, using the graph builder. When you're done, you can just click done. And I'll show you quickly something that's important in jump, the selection tool here. So it's in your menu bar if you're on the Mac. Uh, if you're on the PC, you may have to hover over your menu bar to get it to unhide. Or you can always go to the Tools menu. It's called the Selection. And anything in Jump, you can select. So I'll just select the whole graph builder here. Because let's say I really liked this graphic output and I want to take it over to Word. So I could just select it in Jump, go to Copy. And then now if I open up Word, I could actually just paste it directly in. And one nice thing about Jump Graphics is there are going to be vector graphics. So in this case, it's actually looking a little bit strange. 
on my screen. I think it's my retina display, but let me show you actually in another option here. Let me go to preview, make a new one here. There we go. And so these are, these are what I mean as vector. So there's actually no pixels here. So one nice thing about jump is if you need to make a billboard and you want to export your graph builder output, uh, you can do it directly with that selection tool. And so let me show you that one more time. I realized I clicked it kind of quickly, but in the menu bar, that big bat plus sign, that's the selection tool. And so anything you need to copy out of jump, just go ahead and select it with that and just do edit copy. All right. So that's the graph builder. So a really nice way of uh, graphing actual output. Um, I'll make one final point. I'm not going to show it, but if you have uh, data with latitudes and longitudes, you can actually graph uh, to the map level. So Jump can connect to open street maps and pull down uh, street level mapping. So I'm happy to talk about that later in question and answers, uh, but I definitely want to show you some analysis. All right, so we'll come back to bubble plot if we have time. Let's look at some analyses. And I say analysis in three platforms because these really are the most used platforms in, in Jump, I would say. Distribution, fit Y by X, and fit model. And to give you a sense of the domains for which these are appropriate, distribution, as we've already seen, is really when you already have, you only have one variable you're interested in, or I should better put it, interested in single variables at a time. You know, you may have a data set with lots of variables, but you're interested in univariate questions. Fit Y by X, on the other hand, is really about relationships among variables. And these can be any kind of relationships. This could be a regression or it could be an ANOVA. Both of those are about relationships between one Y and one X variable. And finally, fit model is when you have variable or relationships you want to understand that are more complicated than just two variables at a time. So this might be a multiple regression or a factorial ANOVA. And that's what fit model really uh, is meant to handle. So let's take a look at distribution a little more thoroughly. I know we only played around with it a bit. And I'm going to open a data set called Consumer Preferences. And this is a nice data set because it's pretty rich. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of data in here. So we have for each respondent, uh, gender, birth year, whether they're single or not, uh, years at current employer, you know, a lot of sensible questions, uh, some job satisfaction questions. Um, this data set does quickly get ridiculous. So we ask them when they brush, when they brush after waking up or brushing another time. We ask them about their flossing, flossing habits too. Um, so some of these columns we won't use, but as you can see, there's a lot of data in this data set. And so I want to talk about distribution because distribution is also a very useful platform when you're first getting to know a data set. And what I mean by this is, like all of you, most of you haven't seen, I would imagine, consumer preferences. So this data set is pretty, pretty new to you. You know, you're not sure what the values are. You're not sure what responses you got. So distribution gives you a great way to understand what you've observed even before you start doing analyses. So I'm actually going to take all the variables here. I'll just take them all at once. And I'm going to click them into Y columns. And notice the distribution, it doesn't matter how many columns you choose, Jump is still going to contextualize the output for each one. So gender will give us different options than birth year. Let me click OK. And I want to show you why I like to do this with every new data set, why I use distribution. So at a glance here, we can really quickly see what we've observed in the data set. So we have age groups, years at current employer. We can already see somebody who's, who's quite atypical, so 50 years at their current employer, um, almost a SAS employee probably, since uh, no one leaves SAS. Employee tenure, so we have these data in here. So notice that without ever having to uh, dig through the numbers themselves, we get a great visualization of really all the data we have in our data set. And because distribution has the linked data property, actually all of Jump, you know, data is linked by selecting it in here, you know, it not only selects it in the data table, but also selects all the extremely satisfied people and all the other output. So because data is linked, we can actually use this platform to explore relationships. You know, if we really wanted to see if people who disagree about working on their career have a different job satisfaction profile, we can actually do that. We can just click between the two and get a sense of uh, whether those differ. Of course, we can formally test that and look at it a little more clearly with another platform, but distribution is quite powerful. Now, I mentioned before that because Jump unfolds in its analysis, all the analyses that make sense from a univariate standpoint will live in distribution. And by that, I mean, if you're looking for a one sample t-test, right, that will be a situation where it's a distribution output with a continuous variable. And so that's an option we're given, as well as testing standard deviations, getting the normal quantile plot if you're looking for normality, or continuous fits if you like to fit continuous distributions. And again, if we're looking at a categorical variable, 
the options will be different, and this is where we'd find our chi-square goodness of fit or doing our confidence intervals about the observed proportions. All right, so that's the distribution platform. So very useful, really useful, especially when you're looking for uh, outliers, screening data, and uh, really a great place to explore patterns and relationships. So let's try something a little more interesting though. Fit y by x. So this is, again, a platform that we're going to use whenever we have bivariate questions. And again, bivariate means whenever we have questions that relate to two variables at a time. And if you think about it, there's lots of bivariate analyses we all know. So simple regression is a bivariate analysis. That's simply a bivariate analysis with a continuous variable as the y and a continuous variable as the x. That's bivariate. Things like ANOVAs, two-sample t-tests, right? Those are all also bivariate in nature, but they have a different structure. They're a continuous y with a categorical x. You notice where I'm going here. This table actually maps out really the four domains of bivariate analyses as distinguished by the modeling types of the panel variables, right? So if your x-axis is a particular variable, that's going to constrain the types of analyses you're going to be able to do. So this little uh, little square here, I actually didn't come up with that. I just stole that from fit y by x. And I'll show you in fit y by x, that's not clickable. This isn't anything you'll ever have to select. Instead, this is a little legend that Jump is using to show you what it's going to do based on what types of variables you provide. And again, going back to the mind of Jump, see why this is powerful. Once I put in the variables, Jump does not have to prompt me for what type of analysis makes sense. Instead, I've told it what makes sense because I, at the start, define my variables. All right, so let's actually try this out. So let's try a y that's continuous and an x that's categorical. So this would be that one-way location. So let's choose one that kind of makes sense. Let's look at salary. And let's look at on the basis of job satisfaction. Are people who are more satisfied making more money? And notice what happened. You may not have seen it, but as soon as I put those two variables in there, Jump designated this as a one-way analysis. And in that case, it's going to put us in the domain of analysis of variance. All right, so here's the output. When we have a nominal x, or in this case, an ordinal x, and a continuous y. Now I want you to look at the drop down here. So again, always click every red triangle. Because Jump has not decided for us what type of analysis, it's only gotten us to the platform, to the interface that allows us to work with these data. And notice that in this case, all the tests that make sense are shown together. So getting an ANOVA, right? I uh, simply click this and we'll get the one way ANOVA output and gives us the, the familiar F value and P value for the F. Under the same dropdown, we also can get just the means and standard deviations. We can use the ANOM method, a different way of uh, doing analysis of variance, really, but when we're comparing to a grand mean. We can do pairwise comparisons, so each pair, students T, or two key HSDs, or even with controls or with BES. And all the non-parametric tests that would be available in this particular setup are also displayed here as well. And so notice something about the structure, and this is again a departure, I think, from a lot of other software. These analyses, the, one that, the ones that make sense structurally, that are really the same analysis, right? So each pair of students T is really the same analysis as a Wilcoxon. I mean, the numeric quantification of the relationship is different, one being non-parametric and the other being parametric, right? But they answer or they address the same question. Do we find mean differences or median differences amongst the groups? And by grouping them all together, this isn't just useful from a uh, practical standpoint, it's also good pedagogically. I definitely found as I was learning statistics with Jump that I uh, saw more connections among related analyses simply because they occur in the same location. It gives a context to what these analyses mean, right? Wilcoxon being really the same thing as a t-test. All right, so that's when we have a nominal x by a continuous y. I'm going to keep this open because I want you to compare that to a continuous x with a continuous y. So we're going to use the identical platform, analyze, fit y by x. Let's look at salary again as the y response. But let's do it this time on the basis of age in years. Notice what happened. Jump. So this is a bivariate analysis. Let me click OK. And if you look at this again, we haven't produced any output by default. But if we click the red triangle, notice that the analysis options here of course, are different. Totally different things are appropriate when we have two continuous variables. So in this case, we wouldn't fit an ANOVA, we would be fitting a line. And so here I can just get the linear fit. Now I want to point out something. 
When I produced that linear fit, I was even given a new red triangle. So again, jump is really built on this progressive or hierarchical interface. As you produce output, more things are available. So once we're in a domain, fit y by x, where we're looking at bivariate relationships, and when we have continuous variables and have fit align, this is a very narrow sense of data we're in right now, notice the options here, and there's a lot of them, make sense. So one that you might be looking for is, let's say, plotting residuals. So if I expand that, I can scroll down and we get these nice residual plots. Now my point in showing this is, again, as you get to know Jump, as you get to learn about how it thinks, if you were from the outset to be asked, where would diagnostic plots be for a linear fit? I want you to think about, well, where would linear fits live? Well, linear fit would be bivariate, so it's going to be fit y by x. It'll involve two continuous variables, okay? And to get a diagnostic plot, well, we need to have a model fit to it, so we'd have to fit a line first. And so as you start to get to no jump, it will hopefully become obvious that, of course, that's where residuals will be, right? They'll be in a red triangle under a linear fit you've produced. So it may seem, and I don't know if it is, but it may seem intimidating at first, but I promise you the learning curve for jump is such that once you understand what jump thinks, it becomes actually very easy to predict what jump is doing and where jump will have things. All right, so those were the analyses when we had Let's see, a continuous versus a categorical and a continuous versus a continuous. Let me show you a couple more. How about a categorical versus a categorical? This is a, a traditionally contingency analysis. All right, so again, analyze fit y by x, right? The same platform, the same setup, but instead we're going to put in two categorical variables. So let's do working on career. Okay. And let's do it on the basis of age group. And so age group right here. Notice that jump designates this as a contingency. Let me click OK. And I wanted to do this one, and I want to piece through it a little bit more, because jump is doing something really neat with this plot. And unless you've used jump before, you've probably never seen a mosaic plot. And so the mosaic plot is doing several things at once. Remember, what we're trying to quantify, or what we're trying to understand with this type of setup is, uh, are people agreeing or disagreeing at different rates based on what age they are? And are they agreeing or disagreeing about working on their career? And so from the outset, we should expect that people who are older are working on their career less. Right? When you're younger, you should be working on it more. All right, so that's what this plot is attempting to show us. But it's showing us three things really separately. The first thing it's showing us, and I want to bring your attention just to the side over here. I just dragged it out by hovering over an edge. What we're looking at here is the marginal distribution of agreement. How many people overall, ignoring everything to the left, just overall, in that variable, how many people disagreed and how many people agreed. All right, so that's what that shows us. So we can see most people are agreeing and fewer people are disagreeing. All right, ignore everything above the bottom line. I want you to look at the spacing of these bins, right? Look at the spacing between this edge here and then look at it for 50 to 54. Now, what I hope you see is that the 25 to 29 section is wider. And what that's showing us is the marginal distribution of age groups. And in fact, if I let me just go to the distribution platform, I'll pull up age group here. And so this is looking at it on its side. Remember what I did to stack that? Went to the top red triangle and stacked. So notice that the 25 to 29 category has more individuals in it than any of the others. And so the width of this bin is going to be wider. And that's true all the way across. So the x-axis scaling here is actually giving us a sense of the marginal distribution of age group. But the magic of the contingency plot, of the mosaic plot, is what happens on the interior. Notice that within a particular age bin, we also see the distribution of agreement and disagreement. But it's the contingent distribution. So it's given being 25 to 29, how likely are you to say agree versus disagree? And what we can see is that this contingent distribution, the one that's on the inside of each age group, isn't the same or isn't homogeneous across all the age groups. And this is the same thing as saying there is statistical dependence here. We can see the dependence. As you're getting older, the probability you're going to disagree is increasing. Right? We don't have to get causal necessarily with it. Maybe there's other things that are accounting for this. But at least from a statistical standpoint, information is imparted from the x variable to the y. We know something about the y variable, agreement or disagreement, more than chance by knowing somebody's age. So that's what the mosaic plot shows us. And at the bottom here, we get the familiar analyses. So you get your Pearson chi-square or likelihood ratio test. So certainly rejecting the null in this case. 
So notice that this platform does a lot for you with one little visual. Now, like all platforms, again, you want to look at these red triangles whenever you uh, get a chance. So you can set your alpha level. You can do the analysis of means for proportions, correspondence analysis, and exact tests if you're using uh, Jump Pro. So a lot of additional options there as well. All right, let me uh, hold off on this one for a second because I want to show you something else you can do with FitY by X. What we've been doing so far is putting variables in one at a time, but that's only part of the story. Some of the power of Jump is how easily scalable these outputs are. And remember with distribution, I was able to take a bunch of variables all at once and visualize them. So it took me no time at all. In FitY by X, you can do the same thing. You can have multiple variables all acting at the same time. So for instance, I can take salary and I'll take working on the career. Let me put those both in as Y. And let me take age group and how about job satisfaction and put them in the X. Notice Jump says now this is mixed platforms. And really we're going to have four analyses. Age group with the X against each of these as the Y. And job satisfaction has the X with each of these as the Y. So four different analyses. Let me click OK and look what Jump does. We have this split. So the different X variables, really going across sections here, so age group and job satisfaction, and then different Ys in the Y space. So at the same time, we're going to be able to do a lot of different analysis. And I want to show you one final trick, and I actually alluded to it way back in the anatomy of Jump, and it's an important feature called broadcasting commands. And I only bring this up because this is part of the efficiency of Jump. Let's say you're in this situation, and clearly, if you have two one-way analyses, and you're going to run an ANOVA on one of them, almost certainly you would want to run the ANOVA on the second one. Now, I could have clicked this. I can go ANOVA for this one and then click over here and do ANOVA for this one. That turns out to be slow when you have, let's say, a thousand variables and you want to do a thousand ANOVAs all at once. In just one additional key keystroke, you can do this. And on the Mac, it's holding down Command. On the PC, you'll hold down Control. So I'm going to hold down Command before I click the red triangle. I click Command, holding, click the red triangle, click Means ANOVA, and then I'm going to let go of the Command key. And so you'd use Control if you're on the PC. But notice what Jump did was it broadcasted that command, the ANOVA, to any other output in the window that could receive it. And in this case, there's only one additional output that could receive it, the other one-way analysis. Now that trick also works for the gray triangles. Now you see me minimize some things. Let me hold down Command before I click that, and notice it minimizes the other summary of fit. I'm going to do the same thing for the ANOVA. So notice gives, this gives you a powerful way to really quickly operate on lots of different variables all at once. So that's just called broadcasting a command. And finally, just remember that you can always use a by variable here as well. So if I recall this analysis, let's say you wanted to break that up by people who are single and people who are not single. So you can get a lot of deep. This is going to be eight analyses all at once. And so now I've broken it apart by single status for those four different analyses. And so notice that in combination, the platform setup windows, right here in Fit Y by X and all the platforms, these sections really let you do a lot all at once. All right, now I wanna just quickly point you uh, in a direction for Fit Model. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility to Fit Model, but I just wanna show you something really simple with it. And uh, let me go to a data set called Analgesics. And I want to use this one because it's a really simple example of what a factorial ANOVA would be. And a factorial ANOVA, remember, is when you have two categorical variables that form factorial combinations. So in this case, we have a gender crossed with drug. So some males are on drug A, B, or C, and some females on drug A, B, or C. And we've measured pain response for them. Now under Analyze, Fit Model, like I said, is a general modeling platform. And it's built around personalities. And I'll just let you look at these for a second. The personality we're going to use today is standard least squares, which is your ordinary least squares regression. There's a lot of other uh, specialized versions here, generalized linear modeling or generalized regression or even mixed models. But we're just going to leave that on standard least squares. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put pain as my Y variable. So that's a, a role we've seen before, the response variable. Ignore the, all of this for a second, because what we're going to look at are constructing the model effects. So up to now, we've only been able to use a single variable as a model effect. But what we're going to do is we're going to make a full factorial. So we're going to have main effects for each of our variables, plus an interaction between them. Now I want to show you two ways to do this. One way 
is to add each of our main effects, so gender and drug, and then with one of them selected on the right and the other selected on the left, we can click cross. And cross will define that interaction for us. So we're not going to have to parameterize. There's no making dummy variables in jump. Jump does the parameterization in the background. This would be a full factorial ANOVA. Now, if you have more than two variables, making all those interactions yourself gets to be kind of tiresome. So let me show you a quick trick, and I want to mention this because it just becomes incredibly useful. Selecting both of the variables on the left allows you to click macros and select full factorial. And jump will actually define the full factorial in the exact same way. But if you have more than two variables, it'll do all the two-way interactions, all the three-way, up to however many you have. Now I'll just give you a quick sense of what this looks like. Let me click Run with FitModel. Uh, I select a minimal report, so usually you'll get some more graphics. I like minimal report because it shows me the least. Now if you're going to use FitModel, there's one place I always like to point people to. Click on that red triangle. I mean, do this on every platform. But go to Factor Profiling and turn on the Profiler. Because what the Profiler is, is an interactive profile of your model. So in this model, I have levels dialed in. I can dial in for male or for female. And if I click the female, what I'm seeing here is the profile for drug. So for females, those are the differences. Not much difference between drug A, B, and C. But if I click on males, notice there actually is actually a pretty profound difference. A being lower than B and B being a little lower than C. So by clicking left and right here, what we're actually profiling is that interaction term. Not statistically significant, but still accounting for a lot of sums of squares. I mean, nearly statistically significant. And so what that's doing in the model is modulating the effect of drug. Now, interactions go both ways. So if I click the different drugs, the pattern of effects for male and female will differ. So A, on drug A, they're both pretty similar. On drug B, males are higher than females. And drug C, males are higher than females. So the profiler gives you a great way to understand these models. And I'll show you the exact same thing, the profiler. Let me do it in the context of a multiple regression. And so this is something called fitness. So these are fitness data for a lot of people. Let me do fit model again. And remember, because jump is sensitive to the modeling types of your variables, I can predict something like oxygenation. And let me take two of these variables. They're both continuous. Let me go to macros and let me do full factorial. So this is the exact same setup as the one-way ANOVA, but Jump knows to treat these variables as continuous predictors, and it's doing the multiple regression. I'm going to, again, go to the red triangle, go to factor profiling, and I'm going to turn on that profiler. So I want you to see how useful this profiler is. So in our model, we have an interaction term. We have the main effects for each runtime and run pulse. Uh, our interaction terms are centered polynomials, so you always center your variables before taking the cross products. Jump does that for you. Just be aware it does. But I want you to see what this profiler lets us do. So again, interaction not statistically significant, but still non-zero. So what that means is, depending on the level of runtime I have, the effect of run pulse on oxygenation is changing. That is, the slope of this variable is modified by the level of the first. That's what an interaction is, right? And if you look at it in the profiler, being very low on runtime, there's actually a negative relationship between pulse and oxygenation. And if I go to the very high side of runtime, we're almost getting into a positive slope. So in complicated models, this profiler is incredibly valuable for profiling. And there's plenty of options under here. I won't go into any of them. Uh, but like most things in Jump, you see very little at the start, which makes Jump very friendly and very easy to use. Uh, but there's a tremendous amount of power hidden beneath these red triangles. So as you start to learn the software better, try a few things. Actually explore a bit and uh, see what you can find. All right, so that takes us to the end of this section. Now I want to point out some resources, and then I'll take some questions. Uh, I'll do this quickly. So the learning library, uh, jump.com slash learn. I would certainly suggest you check out the learning library. This has a lot of resources, and it's really organized around procedure. I mean, the software, as I said, is organized around a process. But jump uh, resources, we organize around procedures, because we know that's how a lot of textbooks are set up, and that's what a lot of people search on the basis of. So for instance, if you wanted to learn about correlation or regression in Jump, simple linear regression for instance, you can view a one-page guide. And so these are single-page PDFs that give you step-by-step -step instructions using sample data. Or if you'd rather see it done, there's a watch demo. And so this will click you over to YouTube. And these demos are about two to five minutes. And so pretty quick. And so you can learn a new procedure 
in no time at all. So definitely check out the learning library. You already discovered webinars on demand. You're listening to me, so you know about the webinars. Uh, concept discovery modules. I pointed out a couple of the built-in uh, concept discoveries, but jump.com slash tools have a great uh, set of resources if you're teaching statistics. So simulations for the sampling distribution of sample means, uh, confidence interval simulations. So these are all free of charge. You can just download these and uh, actually see some of these abstract statistical concepts come to life through Jump. And uh, finally, built-in teaching aids. We already looked at some of these, um, but there was one I didn't show you. So if you are doing an analysis, let me go to distribution. And this is one I just like to show, of course, go to fit uh, continuous variable here. I'm going to imagine I'm testing a mean. And so let's imagine under the null hypothesis, the mean was supposed to be 80. So this is our one sample t-test. Now, one thing I like about uh, testing any means in jump is you get a representation of the sampling distribution of sample means. And so we can actually see our actual value is observed right at the critical value. And so almost extreme enough to be counted as good evidence against the null. Under that red triangle, there's also a p-value animation, which allows you to see how your p-value would change on the basis of different specifications for the null hypothesis. And there's one additional, which is the power animation which allows you to look at how power is actually affected by where you think that distribution is under the alternative relative to the null. So some great built-in teaching tools. And again, that's whenever you fit a mean, you'll get the options under the red triangle. All right, so I want to stop here and make sure I have time for some questions. But uh, thank you so much for listening. And I realize I, I went up right to the end. So if you have to run, my email address is here. And I always like to answer questions, uh, certainly by email too. So let me open it up and see if uh, Walter has any questions.